This is our Strawn and Vivian Donnelly family lecture. It is named in remembrance of Strawn and Vivian Donnelly and their support for the Land Institute's radical vision over decades. They deeply believe that we make connections when we can engage with nature, and they had a special connection to the prairie. Our work at the Land Institute and our collective work together stands on a foundation built by the Donnelly family and thousands of other individuals who have contributed over the decades. For them and for you, we are perennially thankful. And I am humbled to introduce the, present, the presenter for this lecture, Huascar Medina, the poet laureate of this great state. Thank you. He says, quote, as a second generation immigrant and a first generation Kansas, Kansan, it took me a long time to find a place to call home. And what I love about Waskar is that he challenges and disproves the mythological notion that your home place can only be where you were born. New roots can develop, and home can be anywhere you choose. Home is arguably inside your human body. So, um, and, and he, I'm not even gonna say the rest of it, it's just he should just go. So um, with that, I'll just introduce and bring you up here, my Kansan brother. Huascar Medina. It took three years, but I finally have a podium in front of me. So thank you for that. I had to find one in the prairie. I would like to start with just an introduction. Um, about poetry myself and how I use poetry. I'm just a poet writing poetry for ordinary people so they may experience an extraordinary moment of truth and empathy. As a second generation immigrant living in the heartland of the United States, I am actively exploring and challenging the boundaries between location and identity. I want my work to blur the man-made borders that separate us. I want my words to create lines of compassion between diverse members of our society who may never have an opportunity to connect by choice or circumstance. I believe poetry is the path to understanding. It is the path of least resistance it is the widest path for us to travel down together. Poetry allows us to speak with grace, to simultaneously hold vigil and protest, to share hard truths in soft ways. Poetry can also be prayer, a collection of possibilities, the remnants of a time past or the promise of a future unlived. It is all encompassing because poets concern themselves with all things viewing the world with a concerned eye at all times. We do not practice vigilance. We are naturally predisposed by it. We see and feel deeply. Thank you to the Land Institute for allowing me to be here today. Emily, thank you for your assistance, and Rachel and Wes Jackson, thank you so much. <laughs> In the last three years, I have attended over 100 readings, workshops, and presentations. I have done over 50 commissioned poems across the state and some outside of the state. I've traveled thousands of miles, and that's with COVID, so I had a lot of making up to do this past year. And I've been on the road for the last month. 
Uh, this is where I picked up this notebook in Liberal Kansas this week, where I was able to give books away to high school students, because I do believe that the work that I have tried to begin in Kansas for Latinos in the arts, um, and that others have done before, must continue with the next generation of artists and Latinos. I will begin by letting everyone know that there are poets in the room, because a bunch of you wrote in typewriters in a horse trailer the last couple of days, and I've taken those words and, and put them together, not edited those words, but just slightly grouped them in ways that I feel were appropriate. Um, with your permission, I would like to share a couple of those, those poems that were, were built, and um, no one's names attached to them. I've, I've decided to say that these poems are written by the prairie. So these are the poems written by, written by the prairie. There are two different types of universes that we are in. One could be that all universes are just floating around in space. Another idea is that the universes could be bulging out from bigger universes. That would mean that we could be a giant universe or just a small one when compared to other ones. When Isaac Newton was six or seven, he made a machine to feed his chickens that he was able to operate from his bedroom window. This was before he discovered gravity and how rainbows work. Fannie Lou Hamer, George Washington Carver, these are the seeds of the black radical tradition in the soil, soil in Salina, cold soil on my feet in Salina, stanzas and secluded verses still searching for the roots, chase this day of wasp and frisbee, sleepless nap times and perennial grains. It is wonderfully interesting to experience the resonance of souls that take a place at a gathering of people who feel called to the same purpose, gentleness, kindness, and joy are together the fertilizer for good. A lot of writing was done, but I would like to get to my work shortly, but I wanna share one more with you because these are wonderful pieces of, of poetry uh, written by the prairie. My great-grandmother taught me to can pickled peaches, and, tom and tomatoes we ate them with fresh biscuit made with bacon grease from a hog my dad raised last year. The milk and the biscuits came from our neighbors, milking cow which was stored in a pump house over an old deep cold well. The tomatoes grew in my mother's back garden, big, fat, juicy tomatoes we peeled quartered and stewed. My great uncle Bill grew the peaches next to his big old farmhouse. Now I grow tomatoes to eat apples to dry, cherries to pickle if only my neighbors had a cow. <laughs> that there are only a few species for grandparents, human beings being one of them. Why are we so lucky? I never know what I'm going to read, and I've been reading this book for over two years across the state. And it, it's always the moment presents itself and allows me to read um, what needs to be read. It's the only way I can describe it, what, is, what I'm compelled to, to read in the moment. And the conversation earlier about apocalypse, I thought about um, in context to religion um, at the Frank Lloyd Wright Church in Kansas City, I was commissioned to do a poem to uh, A Love Supreme by John Coltrane, and I focus on Psalms, the last portion of it, because that is also poetry. And my theory is the reason why the apocalypse hasn't happened is because of a solo that John Coltrane played in The Love Supreme. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and, and this is that poem. The last psalm. 
his psalms, the last song before revelation, freeing and protecting our bodies, saving our souls, and saving our souls, and saving our souls again, if need be. As long as he's playing that psalm, seven trumpets remain silent, awaiting their solos, unable to bring forth woe, an act worthy of divinity in itself, an act even angels find hard to follow. I will share a found poem uh, before I get into Um Mango Grows in Kansas specifically. Um, the news has been kind of difficult for me to watch when it comes to the issue of immigration and the way that um, we're being used as, as pawns um, for political motives. Um, I've only removed two words from this article that I found in USA Today. Uh, those words were um, yellow-headed. Today's headlines, birds plunge from the sky. Today, watch, hundreds of birds suddenly drop from the sky in Mexico. Share this via Facebook, Twitter, or email. New graphic video shows a group of blackbirds suddenly plunge to the ground in Mexico. Many died while others flew away. The reason remains unclear, but some say they may have been trying to escape a predatory bird swooping from above. <clears throat> this book begins my journey arriving in Kansas. And the first poem is titled, Arriving in Kansas. I rode a Greyhound bus to Kansas in 2001, and it was a very long, long Greyhound bus ride. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've, I've traveled a lot in my life. I've been a traveling poet for over 10 years. I've seen a lot of this state and other states, and, and I've seen a lot of floors and couches along the way. So um, I was glad to, um, to have finally found a home in Kansas. It really is. I would like to acknowledge my parents, which I do in the beginning of this book. My father is Puerto Rican, my mother is Panamanian. To my parents, you came a long way to bring me here. We are so far away from your homes. I hope our ancestors remember me. Arriving in Kansas, part one. I hear the melodies of metal arcs in the hinges of a swinging door, doors that lead to tall gray steps climbed in stages towards a window seat, the only chair without a safety belt. Charcoal black turns clockwise, tugging towards anything other than before, a pull of freedom sensed as progress, a fetish for forward motion, romanticized in our devotion to time, submission to time, religion of time, our pocket dictators tapping through glass, fearful of time elapsed, infinite ellipsis. It wasn't dusk or sky emanating through cracked glass at the Greyhound bus that awakened me. Not the hum of rubber to asphalt from soft new wheels in ecstasy with the heat of friction. There is a river god on wheels who presses the gas pedal, taking me to a new type of prison. Two, it was always the little things. Chirping from a single circling dormant 611-303 lug nut, natural, steel that whistles when we break because the mechanic was too busy to tighten it up or too distracted by the world to care enough about the safety of those who traveled together. But I have always traveled alone on buses and taxis, trains and planes, my ticket pocket 
placed in a blazer, the kind we are expected to wear at our wake, a constant reminder that the only destination worth traveling to is in ourself and no one can come with us in the end. Life's the longest Midwest goodbye. Dying a ceremony we are forced to pay for after the gone are long gone and along their way to the last stop after off ramps truly become one ways, no turnarounds, no detours, all stop and black tops, too macabre to acknowledge daily, our journey is exiting. Three, the sound of breaking. I pull a ticket stub from my pocket glance at my watch. We were never on time. I read my receipt, itinerary, city, arrival, layover, departure. My uh, favorite poet is Neruda and Jimmy Santiago Baca. They've written some of the most important work that's influenced me over the years. Um, my favorite book by Jimmy Santiago Baca is Immigrants in Our Own Land. Um, it's still, I still read it regularly, and it's still very true today. Um, this poem is entitled Spanish Knotted Feather Stitching. Only Neruda can save us. I've written him pleas for guidance, addressed it to the waning crystal moon on that red branch of the now gone autumn in his window. They're cinched with threads to palomas who refuse to wear the satchels my abuelita knitted through manos anudado before her passing. Las palomas argued for practicality, balance, and against my need for sentimentality. The added weight of things makes flight onerous, they'd say. How I wish these birds were more passenger pigeon, less dove, willing to fight through wind and rain to get there, okay with war and loss. I've even taught them to fly in cursive, in case they didn't make it, so others may see the phrases passing by before they're shot down. But very few people see the need for soft, round words free and flowing in the air, their grace appearing indecisive, almost lost from below. How they've pitied them, poor palomas, I beg of you, please take these notes to his shores, sing towards the sill in his view, be candid, have manners, wipe the sand from your feet before entering, bathe in his cafe, perch yourself upon his finger piece, I just have to know. Can a song of despair come before a love poem? I've had difficulty reading this week, a lot of these poems, because they're, they're very uh, dear to my heart and uh, this is very well the last time that I will um, do this Umango and Cass's presentation as the Poet Laureate, so this is, feels like a swan song a little bit today. <clears throat> the next poem is entitled, Por Favor, and it's me trying to investigate what the colonizers have done to Puerto Rico. Um, not only have I been removed from Spanish, but I've also been removed from Taino, so I feel separated from my mother tongue. Um, and this poem um, references At the Bay, who is the creator um, in Taino mythology. And it ties to a story about um, the male children were taken from their parents, and if they cried, they were turned into frogs. I believe this story has uh, continued subconsciously into the myth of the Goki, which is the frog from the island of Puerto Rico. Um, and it's said that if that frog ever leaves the island of Puerto Rico, that it will perish. And I think about my father and how much his family told him to not go to the mainland, to stay in Puerto Rico. So this poem is Por Favor, and it's, uh, 
to ask a prayer. Toa, toa, mother, madre, atabe, please come home. Take me to the beach sands infinite, blanketing us with abandoned time. These men are monsters, they are not gods. Why do you hide? Toa, toa, mother, madre, atabe, please come home. I'll perish if I leave, turn frog for crying, goki, goki. I will not stay without you. This has not been home. These men are monsters. They are not gods. Please don't leave us all behind. Toa, toa, mother, madre, atabe, please come home. These men are monsters. They are not gods. Save me, from me, from us. One of the highlights of being published in my life was being published in a literary magazine I wanted to be published in. So <laughs> it doesn't happen often. Uh, we poets spend probably 95 plus percent of our time in a state of rejection. So <laughs> you have to celebrate when it does go our way. Um, this poem is entitled Mi Isla, and it uh, deals with isolation that I feel um, when I first came to Kansas and how alone I felt being here. Um, there are some words that I'd like you to know what they mean in Spanish. El yunque is a junk one in Puerto Rico. Un brindis por ti, papá, is a toast for you, father. Coquis de parranda are the frogs, and parranda is Christmas caroling uh, during the holidays. And uh, there's this quiet, unspoken pressure that you should go home for the holidays in Puerto Rico, and if you don't, maybe there's a, a fight or a rift in the family, so you have to show up. And I haven't in a few years, so I will try to rectify that this next year, hopefully. The other word is very important to me. My father's father is a descendant of, of slaves. They cut sugar cane on the island of Puerto Rico, and they're referred to as hibados. And hibados are, are peasant farmers. Um, and uh, they're not treated with respect. They're seen as uneducated, not smart, not intellectuals. And I see correlations sometimes when I first moved here and people tell me, why would you move to Kansas? You know, there's nothing but farmers there and, and whatnot. So, um, which is really interesting. I, I, um, I stopped explaining why I moved here. I, I started asking why they haven't left where they're at. So. <laughs> Mi Isla. I ate a mango today. It was mostly green with reds and yellows. El yunque at dawn is mostly green with reds and yellows. My homeland's enchanted, full of shady jungle mountains, gawking naked beaches, slowly necking ocean. There, sea breezes woo the palm trees and peeping coconuts faint from holding on too long and sand asleep, daydreaming of me. Tonight, Un brindis por ti, papá. Let us pretend the crickets are drunken coquis de paranda, struggling with loss, singing in the wrong key, playing out of tune, unable to find their way home. Let us pretend we are surrounded by vacation, not work, that all this wheat is beach, that the above blue is ocean. Let us pretend you are watching me ripe in a hammock's womb, strung to horizons with no ocean or beach sand near nor fear that I've become landlocked here, surrounded by hibados who don't like hibados, still an island. <clears throat> Thank you. Very welcoming crowd, I really appreciate that. Next poem is entitled, When is Mango Season in Puerto Rico? Um, my sister's relationship with my father is distant. My, my parents split when I was young. Um, it's something I'm working on, uh, reconnecting with my father, but it's a choice she's made not to, and I respect it. Um, but she came to me and asked me, when is mango season in Puerto Rico? And I had no idea. 
<laughs> so I had no idea. So we went down a TripAdvisor rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> so this is, this is that poem. So when is mango season in Puerto Rico? A TripAdvisor question from Jack. And there is a response from the entire island of Vieques on TripAdvisor, apparently. <clears throat> and it's somewhere in Vieques, there's always a tree with fruit. You just need local knowledge. I have yet to see a mango tree in Kansas. I buy my fruit in a whole food store. Most things here are from elsewhere. Even my jam travels into town. Do you know they grow a type of heaven in an orchard in a place called Santa Cruz? A mango spread, non-GMO, organic, 40 calories per tablespoon? <laughs> it smells fleshy, like roadside mangoes, dropped from a tree, too ripe to grow, too old to save. There was a summer in Yabacoa where the street side parking lots and driveways were paved in mangoes. We ate mango flavored everything that summer. The taste of mangoes will make your eyes close. I ate my first gusano that July. I didn't mind. I never saw it. It was still bliss. Fruit flies are angels born in their own kind of heaven. So, for, uh, for those who don't know, gusanos are worms, so, and you can't really tell what they taste like because they're eating mango, so you're eating something that's eating mango. Texture's similar. Just, uh, uh, being the first Latino polarette came with its own um, pressure, I think, just from the brown community in general. And um, I, I do not speak for all of us. I never have. I know my story and only share my story, but also the stories of my friends that they share with me, that they trust me to share. Um, and this poem is about a time that I went to Emporium. We're at the William Allen White House. And um, it was just interesting to walk into a space and, and not see anyone like me anywhere around the entire time I was there. <clears throat> so, this is a poem maybe about that. Maybe I don't want to focus on troubles, face the longness of my days, all weather vane circling in place. In me, immunity to dawn and dusk exists. I am always awake, so only no daydreams. Each day, we eat the light until only the bone of night is all that's left, then thrown away. I am part compass, part lost, part metal, all rooster. If you feel lost, focus on direction, not me. The sun is constant, the moon is fickle. I only know where whispers travel, the path of kites, the direction laughter leaves, where dandelion seeds still float, why leaves walk away, how long songs can fly, and the best times to ask flowers to dance. I am as useful as whim and pen in a cartographer's hand, lashing out, mapping out work I'm expected to do in front of strangers, seeing lines as paths to somewhere beautiful. But even a compass can be misplaced. This uh, next poem is dedicated to uh, a couple of my friends who are DACA recipients, dreamers, uh, who every two years have to consider if they're gonna be able to live you know, in this country because uh, they were brought as children, uh, not by their own choice, uh, just because their parents were looking for a better life for them trying to be good parents. Um, and it seems like every election cycle, this is uh, up for grabs again. <clears throat> this poem is entitled La Humedad. 
La humedad is a reference to the humidity, the, the climate I believe we're living in, how difficult it can be to breathe. Um, we would take trips to Kansas City, and in the car we'd listen to salsa and merengue, and we'd get up there, and just for one day, we felt like we were surrounded by the cities that our parents grew up in because the language was all Spanish. There were, you know, Puerto Ricans, Panamanians, Mexicans, Hondurans. Like, we're just, like, everyone was there. There's a lot of cologne. There's a lot of rum. It was a beautiful time. <laughs> the music was great. Um, but this poem is about that. This poem is about La Humedad that uh, some people exist in. At 1400 Main Street, I asked for Una Cuba Libre, sin hielo. Un Puerto Rico rico, otro Nuevo México, otro Venezuela, paz en Guatemala, paz en Panamá, y un Salvador para el Salvador y algo diferente para Argentina. Within the Chesterfield, I dance con música alegre, merengue, bachata y salsa. Acá bailamos to the rhythm of the son clave en la humedad. En esta humedad, en esta humedad, en esta humedad, en esta humedad. Because sitting, wishing, and waiting would be hopeless in the climate we can't breathe in. En esta humedad, en esta humedad, en esta humedad, en esta humedad. Y el clima puede afectar su dolor. But I won't suffer silently. Tears be down my brow. Cries come out in song. And worry turns and dips as we protest and dance with hand in hand la humedad. En esta humedad, en esta humedad, en esta humedad, en esta humedad. <clears throat> I get mixed feelings about the next poem I sh I'm about to share. It's a very straightforward poem. I'm not hiding behind metaphor. Um, I think sometimes simple truth should uh, exist without meter and rhyme. Some may not consider it a poem, but I do. <clears throat> the words that are used to describe us really affect us. Uh, the term immigrant has been weaponized against a lot of us um, in places where they don't want us. And I've been looking for a new word for a long time or a phrase that I could use for myself to describe myself. Because I believe those who define you also control you and I would like to control my narrative. And this poem is entitled, New American. Don't call me immigrant. I'm the new American striving in New America as a New American. I am not your invader, not an animal, no criminal. I am a just person, just striving in a New America. In New America, I'm a full-time student, overtime worker, volunteering in my free time, if I plan enough ahead for free time, if I can even afford the free time, if my free time is approved. I work hard in New America. Third shift warehouse, second shift my house, always on call, no days off, freelance for life, four jobs a week, blue and white collar. Don't call me immigrant. I'm the new American, surviving in New America as a new American. I am not your invader, not an animal, no criminal. I'm a just person, just surviving in a new America. This is new America. Student loans for all, high rent, higher utilities, low pay, rising health care costs, the cost of living deadly, no living wage, living in rage, my cousins in cage for wanting to live in a safer part of New America. Don't call me immigrant. I'm the New American living in New America as a New American. I'm not your invader, not an animal, no criminal. I'm a just person, just living in a new America. 
strong and proud, able to withstand the distance I've traveled, the distance from my family, the distance between us, the distance in our dialects, the distance in our churches, the distance in our homes, the distance between my ancestors and my grandchildren, the distance from the streets to the dorm rooms, the distance from the field to the corner office suite. Don't call me immigrant. I am the new American, dreaming of new America as a new American. I am not your invader, not an animal, no criminal. I'm a just person, just dreaming of a new America. Old America, don't be afraid. We are all America, North America, Central America, South America. We are all Americans, we all strive in Americas. We all survive in Americas, we all live in Americas. They are all the same America. We all dream of a greater America. I want you to be paid a living wage, live in affordable housing without college debt or medical debt or credit card debt or national debt. I want no more racism. I am speaking of a new America. I am part of new America, whether you like it or not. So join me, please. We're gonna switch the order up. <laughs> um, I think a lot about the poets who've, who've reached high literary positions or, or recognition or Latino, and to see them still, still writing about uh, immigration and the border crisis and, and diaspora. I mean, all the way back to Julia de Burgos from Puerto Rico um, in the early 1900s, we're still writing the same work. And, um, you know, Martina Espada just wrote Floaters. Um, Juan Felipe Herrera, uh, first Latino youth poet laureate, wrote, um, Every day we become more illegal. Um, uh, this poem's entitled Todavía. Aquí the street names may have changed, but we still feel the same. After all these years, after all these nights, after all these fights, after all this music, after all these songs, after all this singing, after all these words, I'm still writing lo mismo. What gets me through is love, love of family, love of community, the love I receive from my partner, from my child, from my pets, um, from my hobbies. Um, this poem is a love poem. I think it's always important to acknowledge love. Examples. If the moon shattered and fell out the sky, I would gather its shards, build a mosaic of night so you may sleep and dream in peace. If the sun were to cool, I would dance a blaze in a dervish outside your window so the birds would chirp in the light of false mornings, waking you with love songs. If the sea disappeared, I'd lay mirrors on an ocean bed near the coastline so you could see the blue depths of my devotion and pick it up like sea glass whenever you choose. And if the wind were to stop, I'd whisper in your ear each day to remind you, air can still move you. I do want to share a poem by Mary Oliver that I wrote after her passing called Remorse. Um, she taught me grace through her poetry. You know, you, uh, wild geese, I think about that poem, you know, you do not have to be good, that, that permission that she offered me. Um, 
So I, wrote, I had to write a poem when she left, and I sit in my backyard, and I think a lot, and I just stare at the, the lightning bugs, fireflies, you know, there's different ways of describing them. In death, we are embedded into earth, placed beneath dirt, blind to sky, hidden from our plots of light. How hard the fireflies work each night, transporting our souls from earth to universe, each spirit a filament flickering as cargo until freed and released into ether. Last night, at twilight, I marked the flashes of cold light pulsing as Morse code. Let go, said the lightning bug, let go. I'm be respectful of everyone's time today, and I appreciate you sharing this space with me, so I'll, I'll read a, a, maybe. Another 12 minutes. Oh, well, we okay. We could do that too. Yeah, that'd be fine. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> I originally wrote this poem called Same Old News um, after reading uh, Pedro P. Three's poem, Puerto Rican Obituary. It's a poem I read after Hurricane Maria um, hit Puerto Rico and I couldn't get in contact with my family. So I read his poem at a reading that day because I couldn't read my own work. It didn't feel appropriate. This poem feels relevant again because Fiona just passed through Puerto Rico recently and again, people were without power, without water, seemed loose in agua, that's how we say it. Um, same old news. We still work. Sometimes we are late. We speak back when insulted. We still work. We take days off. We call into work. We go on strike. We still work 10 days a week, two jobs minimum, no overtime, still getting paid for only five, for even less now. We still work. We work harder, much harder, get tired, show up late, call into work, then return to work, broken, broken. We work and work and work and work, we work harder, much harder than before, then we die, we die broke, we die owing much more than before, we die more broken, we die much harder. Juan, Miguel, Milagros, Olga, Manuel are still dying. Juan is bribing local senators, Miguel lost the belt, Milagros disappeared, Olga sings of sadness, Manuel left for Broadway. They are all still dying. We die broken in hurricanes and earthquakes, seen loose y agua in wars from gunshots and therapy, traumatized on drugs and alcohol, alone, emotional and economic depressions are also tropical depressions. Let's talk about this. Aquí se habla Spanglish all the time. Aquí they put America first. Aquí they throw paper towels at us. Aquí they call us all Mexican. Aquí they call everyone immigrant. Aquí we are all the same. Aquí we are all non-white. Aquí we are only brown. Aquí we are the other. Aquí to be called Latino is to be unwelcomed. It's like I'm in a marathon or something, got you know, cups of water and stuff. So. <laughs> this poem's entitled Promesas, uh, Promises. Um, it's one of those ones where I try to use poetry as, as, as prayer or or a mantra, a way of opening possibility, speaking something into being. Um, the first line is in Spanish. It's the same line over and over. It's llamero llaneros, which means any minute now, plainsmen. Uh, before I became poet laureate, I was working at a hotel. Um, I was a glorified janitor, um, and I worked with housekeeping, and 
I was really into my poetry, so I didn't always get things fixed in a timely manner uh, as a handyman. And I'd always say, Yamero, in a minute I'll get it done. So um, this poem is for them who always fed me when things were difficult. Along the way, they always brought extra food to work for me, and it was very motherly of them to do. Yamero, Yaneros, it won't always be this hard. Yamero, Yaneros, they will embrace us. Yamero, Yaneros, they will not fear us. Yamero, Yaneros, they will accept us. Yamero, Yaneros, they will respect us. Yamero, Yaneros, they will not fight us. Yamero, Yaneros, they will not attack us. Yamero, Yaneros, they will not encage us. Yamero, Yaneros, we will not be separated. Yamero, Yaneros, they will not divide us. Yamero, Yaneros, they will not send us back to die. Yamero, Yaneros, we will be welcomed. Yamero, Yaneros, we will live in peace. Yamero, Yaneros, they will see us as equals. Yamero, Yaneros, we will be appreciated. Yamero, Yaneros, they will call us family. Yamero, Yaneros, they will love us. Yamero, Yaneros, they will not hate us. Yamero, Yaneros, it will all be over soon. Yamero, Yaneros, we will forgive each other. I have a poem about um, birds and the way they sound like car alarms. And, I'd always, and I say that it's a reminder that even things locked up can be stolen. So, per Aspera at Astra, the next poem has been anthologized a lot and it's uh, about me finding place and home. I'll read that poem and I'll end with Un Mango Grows in Kansas. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> We were lost in the plains, beautiful and ordinary. Sunflowers in the fields, seeds of fallen stars, standing tall, deeply rooted in this land. I've admired how our flowers shine, grasping towards the sky, beyond the prairie grass, anchored down to earth, mimicking the sun. When a gardener plants the seeds of Helianthus, they are performing magic. Raising stars out of the dust where buzzing planets circle, half red moons set and swarming comets float in orange comas. I've always felt that late at night in the bed of a truck in a Kansas field, we were at the center of this universe. And I was exactly where I should be amongst the flowers, not below. <clears throat> Un mango grows in Kansas. You have found me hidden in a wheat field within a husk of corn growing for you. I am ready. Pick me. Hold me in your hands. Remove my skin. Peel away my color. Find that I am tender, soft, and sweet. Eat of me until there is nothing and your mouths are empty and your bellies filled. What is left will live as seed to grow again, brighter, hardened, and less bitter. Thank you. <laughs>